Well, good morning, and thank you for tuning in once again to the message from Higher Heights Christian Fellowship. I've been hearing a lot of positive feedback concerning the video upstreaming messages, and, and that is great. Um, I'm thankful that we can continue to minister through this venue that we have. I've uh, spoken to many of you already through phone calls um, about the possibility of starting an online fellowship room through uh, Zoom. And if I have not already talked to you about that and you would like to be a part of that endeavor, please let me know. Either call the office or uh, you can let me know through the, the menu where it says connect and just send me a little note that way. And again, we thank you for your faithfulness in continuing to minister with your tithes and offerings. If you uh, need to submit tithes and offerings, you can mail it, you can drop it off at the church, or you can call and we can pick it up. Um, it's very important that we continue to worship the Lord through this means. Well, I'm talking today on a, a serious topic, yet I want to... Um, share some hope with you today as we discuss the topic of depression. Um, I want to sh start off with sharing a story. The testimony is told of a woman in her late 20s who was very involved in church ministry. She had a husband and two children, and by all accounts, she seemed happy to those in her social circles. She began to experience another part of life, though, that was not so happy behind closed doors. Even though she knew a lot of people, she felt lonely. She didn't have joy anymore. The issues of life became larger than life itself, and it seemed there was no way out of them. She would get up in the morning with no energy for her children and remain in her pajamas all day long, having little ambition to care for them. The house would be left a mess uh, and just because she was in a lethargic state um, and how she lived, she had no ambition. And in order to maintain appearances, she would quickly get dressed before her husband came home from work, but he could see that the needs of the day had not been met well. Fear began to manifest itself. Her husband worked shift work, and so he was not always there in the evening and at bedtime. Afraid to be alone at night, she would go to bed with the house lights on, yet that brought little comfort when the terror of the imagination started hearing noises of people breaking in through the basement window. Coming home from the wake of a friend who had just passed away, a demonic presence brought the horror of death to her bedside. Not realizing what was happening to her over these past several months, she began to believe that she was dying. Visions of her children growing up without a mother and uh, writing out her will began to play heavily on her mind. The mental anxiety in her was deeply rooted and dark. After a year of this, she decided it was time to see a doctor and get the diagnosis that she had been afraid to hear. However, the diagnosis was not what she was expecting but it was manageable if it was handled correctly. The diagnosis was depression. That woman was me. While there's more to that story, I share it because I want to address the very practical and very real uh, topic of depression today. I am concerned as a pastor that we stay healthy in body, soul, and spirit. In particular, those who live alone and during this time of isolation. We're currently in a place of mandatory isolation. The time frame of this isolation is not known, and so we don't have the hope of an end date that we can actually look forward to being able to see people again and, and join social circles again. And that in itself creates a problem. We are created to be in fellowship with one another. We are created for community. This season of isolation and anxiety our world is in can easily produce the ideal uh, ingredients and the ideal incubation to trigger the symptoms of depression. I like to make bread. 
The ingredients that you need to make bread are things like flour and oil, sugar, water, uh, yeast. And when you put all those ingredients together in the right order, at the right time, and you set those ingredients when they're mixed in, in the right place with the right temperature, that dough that you've created begins to rise. You can't put it someplace that is too warm so that it, it's in baking temperature, but it can't be someplace too cool because it won't rise. And so it, it's like the ingredients need the necessary place in order to, to, to rise, to uh, germinate, um, and, and, and give it the right ingredient, the right uh, environment for it to be able to rise in. Anxiety and depression are often tools that the enemy will use to steal from us and cause torment. But if we can recognize what is happening, and if we can be proactive to avoid it, if we can invite God into our experience right now, then we can put on the full armor of God, as Scripture says, and deflect the enemy's attempts right back at him and get through this possibly with more joy than we even started out with. I'll let you know ahead of time I'm going to stay close to my notes today because it is such a sensitive uh, topic that I, I, I feel like I need to stay very focused today um, in order to get through what I need to say to you. And while there is, there's, there's more to the topic of depression than can be covered in the next 25 minutes. I, I understand that. Um, and I don't claim to have medical certified expertise on the subject. But I know from personal experience, and I know from ministry experience and study, the devastation that depression can cause an individual in their life and in their family. See, it, it, depression is something that doesn't just affect the one individual. Depression is something that affects the whole family, those who are in, in close contact, in close relation with that person. So grab a piece of paper, a pen, grab your Bible. I have lots of information to give you today. And as we go along, I encourage you to jot down things that that might sound like they might pertain to you or even somebody that you know, um, so that we can begin to dive into this in a personal way. And once we recognize what's happening, then we can deal with those issues. Over my years of ministry, I've, I've prayed with people and I've walked with people uh, through their journey of finding freedom from depression. I had a friend many years ago that used to say that it's okay for a Christian to be depressed. And God's okay for a Christian to be depressed. No big deal. Because David, she said, was the most depressed person that she knew. And if David can be depressed and God considered him to be a man after his own heart, then, hey, she can be depressed too. And it's okay. And God's okay with it. But I want to tell you this morning that... While God will not condemn you and God will not turn you away in your depression, it is not his plan or his desire for you to stay living in your depression. A life lived in depression does not line up with what the scripture says is available to us and what God is desiring for his people. I want to be clear this morning. This isn't about deciding not to be depressed, and it will go away. It's not a positive thinking exercise. I understand that. I also understand that depression involves chemical imbalances, and, and medication is often necessary until such a time that one can function without it. I understand that there is multifacets to this thing called depression. And becoming free from depression can be a lengthy process. We may need medication through it. But I want you to know today that God's intention is to give you a life full of joy and hope and peace. 
He wants you to know and to understand that your identity in Christ, the very fact that you identify with him, enables you to live a life of victory over your darkness and empower you to live and move and breathe with the power of Christ living in you. We just celebrated the death and resurrection of Christ. His death was to provide victory over bondage of every kind, health in every way, and salvation and freedom to all who will accept him. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us to quicken our mortal bodies and to live with less expectation then what he died for is to underestimate his sacrifice. Today I want to share four things with you. And I'm going to focus on these four things in light of the isolation that we are facing currently. And by no means is anything that I'm about to share with you exhaustive. First of all, let's define depression. Depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. Also called major depressive disorder or clinical depression, it affects how you feel, think, and behave and can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. It produces a deep sense of despondency, discouragement, and sadness often linked with a sense of personal powerlessness and a loss of meaning in in, and enthusiasm for life. That's what a life of depression promises us. I can tell you from firsthand experience, it is not fun. It's mental and emotional bondage, which often stems out of our perception of our life and our circumstances. However, scripture gives us a different outlook on the life that we can have using words such as freedom and victory, salvation, life, joy, peace, comfort, healing, power, authority, wisdom, understanding, and so much more. A much different picture of life. Here's the four things that I want to cover with you today. Number one, triggers for depression, symptoms of depression, what scripture says concerning depression, and we'll look at some examples of these. And number four, the scriptural remedy for depression. As we go along for legal purposes, I just want to note that this is not a clinical session. There is no diagnosis available here. I am not promoting anything your doctor would not advise. And I'm not in any way indicating that blind faith can cure depression. What I am telling you is that God has an alternative for those who suffer depression according to his word and by stepping into his diagnosis and healing those sufferings can break free from their bondage. So let's begin. First of all, triggers for depression. And often there's a combination. There are varying levels of what will be experienced. I'm going to capitalize on five of them but I'm going to list all of 16 things that I have. So get your pencil, your paper ready, um, so you can begin to write these down. First of all, triggers for depression, number one, loneliness. Merriam-Webster defines loneliness by saying, sad or dejected as a result of a lack of companionship or separation from others. Being without company, cut off from others, producing a feeling of bleakness or desolation. Loneliness is not a part of God's plan for human beings. Acts 2.42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching 
and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The early church understood the importance of fellowship, the importance of being with each other. They understood the importance of of bringing God into their fellowship and just being united together. They would raise their kids together. They would do ministry together. They would work together. They would worship together. They understood the uniqueness of God's presence through their fellowship together. There's something different. There's something unique when we, we gather together as fellow believers. There's something unique about the presence of God in that atmosphere. That's why scripture says, forsake not the gathering together on a regular basis. Others affirm who we are. Others strengthen us when we're down. Being with others gives us a sense of community that we are, we are a part of something that's bigger than ourselves. Being with others allows us to express ourselves in, in a way that others can respond to. Being with others gives us opportunity to think about others rather than ourselves. We strengthen others. We feel useful when we can contribute to others' needs. We contribute to the lives of other people. God is with his people at all times and in all circumstances. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. We need one another, and this time of isolation produces that sense of loneliness, especially if you are living by yourself. Number two, hopelessness. The scripture calls it faint-hearted in many places. Definition of hopelessness is having no expectation of good or success. Despair. You don't expect anything good to come out of life. You don't expect that after this, there's going to be life as, you, as, as usual. You can go back to work. You can be fulfilled again in society. Hopelessness begins to breed. Many times, hopelessness begins to happen when we begin to question the goodness of God or his faithfulness. It's, it's like a question mark has appeared in our minds concerning his character, We question his motivation, allowing certain things to happen and lose hope in his interest or his ability to help us. Psalm 61.2 says, From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. See, David's remedy to his loneliness. He says his heart grows faint. He's lonely. David's remedy to this was to pray to to be led to the rock that is higher. And who is that rock? That rock is God. To be led back to the one place where hope dwells. That's with God. Number three, fear. The definition, an attitude of anxiety or distress caused by concern over a threat to one's future. An unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. A state marked by anxious concern. There are healthy fears, as we know, and there are unhealthy fears. Healthy fears such as you don't touch a hot stove because you'll get burned. It's about living in fear. This is about fear that consumes you. I'm going to list for you some of those fears. Fear of natural disaster. Fear of thoughts and visions. Fear of the unknown or the abnormal. Fear of embarrassment or shame. Fear of the future. Fear of persecution. Fear of death. Fear of people. 
fear of judgment, fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, or fear of losing control. Again, this is not exhaustive. But those are some of the key things that can consume us and take away from our life. 2 Timothy 1.7 says that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and sound mind. Number four, anxiety. A definition for anxiety, the medical definition is an abnormal and overwhelming sense of apprehension and fear, often marked by physical signs such as tension, sweating, and increased pulse rate. Doubt, concern, doubt concerning the reality and nature of a threat, and by self-doubt about one's capacity to cope with that threat. The season of this COVID-19 can cause a lot of anxiety if we allow fear to create anxiety. If we're fearful about the possibility of catching it, if we're fearful about the future itself, what's going to come afterwards? While it may be something that you, you think about, it's on everybody's mind, but it should not be something that consumes your thoughts and causes you to live in fear over it. Next, we have personal brokenness. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. If we were to take the words crushed in spirit and look at how that, that is described in other translations, Young's literal translation describes it as um, the bruised of spirit. The message talks about and says, if you're kicked in the gut, he'll help you catch your breath. See, personal brokenness has to do with things such as a broken heart, emotional pain and hurt, grief, loss of self-worth. It's an internal suffering caused by external issues or other people, things beyond our control, or facing the personal consequence of your past decisions. We have a broken heart. Our emotions are broken somehow on the inside. We have personal brokenness. And that tends to, to crush us on the inside and steal life from us. Okay, I'm going to give you a list of the, the other ones. I'm not going to go into them, but here's the list. Are you ready? Again, this is um, triggers for depression. Here we go. Addictions, abusive relationships, demonic oppression, rejection, abandonment, external circumstances, overwhelming life circumstances, physical illness or exhaustion, sin issues, a sense of the futility of life, and the loss of the sense of God's presence. Again, the list is not exhaustive. So number two, what are some of the symptoms of depression? What is it that kind of indicates that we might be headed towards that mindset? I'm going to capitalize on two of them, and then I will just share the rest of my list with you. First of all, feeling forsaken by God. Psalm 27, 9 says, Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. David's feeling like, where are you, God? Where are you? And we all go through moments when we feel like God is hiding. See, God will sometimes test us that way just to see how we do, what's really in our heart. Sometimes he will uh, hide, as it were, 
so that we become hungry for his presence and begin to search him out. But it's important to know that he will never abandon his children. Scripture says he will never leave us or forsake us. Yet we can get into places where we just wonder where he is. And when it comes to this in depression, it, it's often a, a clouded state of mind that we, we just don't feel him anymore. We don't uh, know where he is anymore. And yet even in that, it could be God trying to get our attention. Turn to me. Look to me. Because I can help. With this, I want to recommend a book to read called The God Chasers by Tommy Tenney, where he, he, he goes through um, the, the kind of the, the idea of playing hide and seek, a father with, with their child, with their son or daughter, and how the, the father will go and, and hide in places, and the child will go and, and run to try to find the dad. But he doesn't hide so that the child can't find him. He hides so that the child can find him. And it's that reunion of the, the hug. The, the, the father will pick up the child and swing him around in his arms. And it, it's that excitement. And that's kind of the idea that he's presenting with God, as it were, hiding. So that we will go and look for him, find him, and have an incredible time of reunion with him. The second one I want to focus on is negative self-talk. We all do it sometimes, that voice in our head, or maybe we say things out loud, and, and that becomes critical of ourselves or even critical of others. We maybe even experience having conversations inside of ourselves with other people, talking out that winning argument you'd really like to have with them. Negative self-talk can happen as you stand in front of the mirror and critique yourself. And this can easily become uh, the time due to being, having so much idle time on our hands, when we rehearse things in our mind about situations, even in the past, situations that come back as memories, uh, they come flooding back, and even new hurts from people that often seem magnified because we're lonely. We have too much time to think. And this can become a playground for the enemy to blow things right out of proportion to distort things. And suddenly what you once came to have peace about you, is, is now playing on your mind again. And it's that tension, that, that internal tension that begins to create a struggle. And, and these kinds of arguments and self-talk can drive people into a place of despair. 2 Corinthians... Chapter 10, verse 5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, all those internal arguments that we have, all those things that come flooding back from memories gone by that begin to stir up new emotions... We can take those thoughts captive. And when it says we take captive every thought, that take captive is a military term. It's not a, 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 one of those, please, would you go? Please? It's get out of here. I don't want you anymore. I don't have to listen to you anymore. And in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. So we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ because we don't want anything to set itself up against the knowledge of God. All right, here's the list. The remaining um, indicators of depression. Deep sorrow loneliness, confusion, despair, escapism, 
a loathing of life and a desire to end it, lack of motivation, difficulty making decisions, low self-esteem, irritability, anxiety, guilt, disturbed sleep, unexplained physical pain, self-abuse. Now, side note here, just because you have some of these, it doesn't mean that you're on your way to depression. It's just something to take a, a little mental note about um, and to watch, especially in these times of being isolated and lonely. Number three, what does scripture say concerning depression? Well, depression was not part of the vocabulary two, three, four thousand years ago, but they used other words in scripture that um, describe it and can be used synonymously with depression, such as afflicted, discouraged, afraid, brokenhearted, forsaken. I want to go through four examples in scripture of people who were in a moment of despair and depression and, and make note of how God brought them out of that situation. The first one is in 1 Kings 19, verses 3 and 4. It says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Wow. This is Elijah. This is the prophet of prophets. This was after the miraculous demonstration of God's power on Mount Carmel when he called fire down from heaven. He just had an incredible a manifestation of the presence of God, the power of God. This was during the, the reign of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And Jezebel had it in for Elijah. They had a bunch of other prophets, uh, prophets of Baal that used to prof prophesy to them all these wonderful things. But Elijah's prophecies weren't quite so promising. Elijah's prophecies told them of, of judgment to come. And Jezebel didn't like that. After the, the, the fire was called down on Mount Carmel, Elijah and his men slaughtered the 450 prophets of Baal that day. And so what does Ahab go? What does he do? He goes and he tells Jezebel, who, by the way, has Ahab wrapped around her finger. He goes and... and, and tattletales what Elijah did. And so she threatens to kill him like she did all the other prophets before Elijah. And that's what he's talking about. I've had enough. I'm no better than my ancestors. And so he runs off and then we pick up where we read in verses three and four when, a, when Elijah runs for his life. We know from reading on that God met with Elijah and brought him food to strengthen him, told him where he needed to go, and eventually brought Elisha into his life to be his successor. But God met with him during his time of despair. The second example is in Genesis 21, verses 15 and 16. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. This is the story when Abraham sent his maidservant Hagar off with um, the son Abraham had with her, Ishmael. Tensions were high between Sarah and Hagar because Sarah did not want Ishmael to take any of the inheritance away from the child that she eventually bore to Abraham as a promised child from God. And so they sent Hagar and Ishmael away with a handbag full of food. And from there, they had to fend for themselves in the desert. The amount of food that you could put in a handbag would not have lasted very long. 
And being a woman, Hagar would have found it difficult uh, to fend for herself. It wasn't like she could just go and get a job somewhere. And she would have had have watched her son cry from starvation. And there would be nothing that she could do about it. She figured he was as good as dead. And so she sat him down and she moved what she what's called the a bow shot away so that she was away from him and she wouldn't have to watch him die. As a mother, this would wrench her heart. And there are mothers today who are, are watching their children suffer or go through things that are beyond their control, and it is heart-wrenching. But God intervenes in Hagar's circumstances, telling Hagar that he has heard the boys crying, and he provides a way of survival and gave them the promise of future success. God met with Hagar in her moment. The third example is Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2. David writes, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and I find no rest. See, here David was feeling separated from God's presence. He's feeling desperately lonely in his suffering. It's not like David didn't know God or his promises. It's not like he had not known the power of God in the past. He had killed Goliath. Yet, with all of his experience, he was susceptible because he felt alone. But look at how David deals with his feelings. If we carry on, in verse 3, it says he remembers and speaks of God's faithfulness in the past. And that is so key, to remember what God has done in the past. Verse 9, he remembers and declares God's purpose for his life. In verses 9 to 19 through 24, he recalls and speaks God's ability to save him and his determination to praise God beforehand. And he concludes this song in verses 25 to 31 by praising God just for who he is and his worthiness. He begins to praise and worship. Praise and worship is a powerful tool. It doesn't matter if you can sing, if you can play anything, an instrument. Just begin to worship. And worship in itself, praise in itself, can break the power of the enemy over your life. Powerful tool. Our fourth and final example from Scripture. We can't possibly talk about depression without going to the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to chapter 2, verses 17 to 20. It says, So I hated my life. Because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And the one who and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my efforts and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. Solomon here is the writer. He says he's going to work and sweat through this life in order to attain things that he will eventually die and have to leave to his kids or some other successor. And they might throw it all away. So what's the point? He spent his entire book looking at his life and how meaningless everything was. We live, we work, we eat, we sleep, we suffer, and then we die. 
He was striving to find meaning to life outside of the pursuits of life. And he found none. But at the end of the book, when he concludes his study, this is what he writes. In chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, he concludes all 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes in just two verses. This is what he says. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commands. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it's good or evil. Solomon says, that's it. The key to everything, the key to not getting sucked into the trappings of this futile pursuit and failure is simply this. Fear God and keep his commandments. Because ultimately, God has the final say. Hmm. Number, f- the four things, scriptural remedies for depression. There's quite a few that I want to give to you. And on the screen, you will see other scripture references that I'm not going to go through with you, but they're there for you to reference. scriptural remedies. First of all, hope. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's our inheritance as believers, joy and peace, and we can overflow with hope. We have hope as an anchor for our soul. Hope gives us security. It says in another scripture that hope enters in behind the veil, and we are allowed access behind the veil. We are allowed access into the secret place of God, into his presence, into the inner courts. We are invited there. And because Jesus is there, we can find hope there. Number two, trust. Romans fifteen thirteen again says, may the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy as you trust him so that you can overflow with hope and power of the Holy Spirit. Number three, choose joy. Psalm 30, verse 11, you turn my wailing into dancing You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. I remember being in my living room, playing some worship music and and just asking God, you know, God, I I just don't feel joyful anymore. I, I, I want joy in my life again. And you know what I heard him say? He says, if you want joy, choose joy. Be joyful. And so at that moment, I, I turned on a little bit more upbeat music, and I began to you know, move my feet and start just dancing in his presence. And the, the sense of joy that came was, was wonderful. Choose joy. Then we have the, the power of the word. When I was going through my depression, I came to a point where, again, I I was afraid of going to sleep at night, and I, I just began to cry out to God and said, God, I don't know what's going on here. I can't do this anymore. I need you to show me something. I, I need something that I can grab from your word that will give me hope and life, and strength, and and start to bring me out of this thing. And he gave me a scripture reference. I opened my Bible, and what it said was, I lay me down to sleep in peace. For you, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. 
And that one scripture verse was enough to, to begin to melt my heart and say, okay, God, I know, I know you're here. And I'm going to start to trust you. It, it gave me something to hang on to. The power of the word of God is, is life. It, it's everything that we need. There's everything that we need in the word of God to sustain us in life. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word of God lives in you, and we are able to overcome by the power of the word of God. We are able to overcome the evil one. Next, we have prayer, Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. See, sometimes we get into such a place where we just don't know what to pray anymore. It's like we've emptied ourselves of everything that we could possibly say in prayer, and it's like, God, I don't know what to say anymore. In this situation, I don't even know what to pray for because I don't know what the answer is. And so... We just begin to pray, and if you have a prayer language, you begin just to pray in that prayer language, and and the Holy Spirit will take that prayer language and and fill it with the right kind of prayers and the right words and take that before the throne of God. In every situation, we do it through prayer. Even Jesus and his life on earth, Scripture says that his he, he offered up prayer and petitions with fervent cries and even tears because he knew the only one who could save him. And so if Jesus needs to do that, then so do we. 1 Peter 3, 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers. Even when you don't think maybe God is listening, stand on this scripture. God is attentive to your prayer. Next, we have practice his presence. 2 Corinthians 3.16 says, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. When we turn our situation towards God, say, God, I can't do this without you, or God, I need your intervention, then God removes, starts to remove that that veil that uh, makes us feel like it's an impossibility. It says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Next, we have renewed vision of God and being centered upon him. Romans 8, 6, the mind is governed by the flesh. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Allow your mind and your thoughts to be governed by the Spirit of God. Renew your vision of who God is. Be centered upon him. That's how we become renewed about who God is, is focus on him. Next we have praise. Psalm 42, 5. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. David talks to himself. He talks to his own soul and says, why are you downcast? Come on, liven up. Don't be so disturbed. Put your hope in God. I'm going to praise him. Doesn't matter what you feel like. I'm going to praise him. He's my Savior and my God. Next, remember what God has done. Psalm 42, 6. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you. The things that God has done for us in the past, how he has come through for us, or even how he's come through for other people and brought answers, brought them out of impossible situations. Think on those things because they become testimonies that we can speak into our current circumstances. And the last one, thankfulness. 
1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is victory that we can have on the other side of what we are, are experiencing currently. If you are going through a time of depression, there is victory on the other side for you. Give thanks to God. Be thankful for all the good things that you currently have. It doesn't matter what it is that you might start with to be thankful for. Maybe you don't think you have anything to be thankful for. But start with, thank you, God, I have clothes to wear right now. Thank you, God, I have a roof over my head. Thank you, God, that you've just put food on my table. I'm not hungry. I'm not thirsty. Thank you, God, that I have a friend. Thank him for the simple things. And eventually, thankfulness will begin to rise up and and you'll be able to see greater things for which to be thankful. Depression can be very complex, very multifaceted, and it can mask a lot of different things. I hope that you are all experiencing the peace and the presence of God during these weeks. And I hope that what I have described today um, is, is not coming close to you. But if you feel that you might be experiencing some of these things, it doesn't necessarily mean the onset of depression. But either way, Know that God will never leave you or forsake you. He is an ever-present help in time of need. And if you need to reach out to somebody, use the connect part on our website and send me a note. Let me know if anything has spoken to you today. But here's what I'd like for you to do this week. Begin to exercise some of the spiritual remedies we talked about. Allow God to show you that his word is true and powerful enough to speak exactly what you need. Pick up the phone and call someone you trust to pray with them. And maybe you are able to be that ear for somebody else so that they can talk to you. And again, if any of this has spoke to you, go to the Connect menu and send me a note and let me know. I want this to be a message of encouragement for you today. I want you to know that God can work through the impossible things and that you are not alone. You might feel lonely, especially if you're living by yourself, but you are not alone. God is with you. And help or company, or another voice to talk to is only a phone call away. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you because you are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. You know everything in our circumstances. You know those who are lonely. You know those who feel downcast. You know those who need victory over their darkness. And I pray, God, that you would speak this word into people's hearts who need to hear from you today concerning depression. And I pray, God, for your protection over your people that you would keep them from entering into times of depression. But I pray, God, that we would know that we have the the power, we have the ability, just because we can identify with you, we are related to you, We have relationship with you, that we have power and authority over all these things. And so, Father, I pray blessing over everyone who is listening to this today and that you administer deeply to their hearts. We praise you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.